There can't be too many nations on Earth that seem more alien or obscure than Tajikistan. Ask the average man on the street who Tajikistan's president is, what currency they use, or who their enemies and allies are on the international stage, and they'll most likely look back at you just as blankly as they would have if you'd asked them those questions in the Tajik language itself. Tajikistan is a nation that is closed off to most of the world, yet it isn't even shrouded in mystery. Whilst hundreds of films and books are written about the secretive state of North Korea every year, with a perpetual fascination surrounding the Kim Dynasty and their tight grip over one of the most repressive regimes on Earth existing among much of the Western world, Tajikistan has somehow managed to become just as repressive without prompting almost any international interest or attention. Until now, and through the lens of football, because that's the sort of thing that we do here at HITC7s. Tajikistan may not be known for its football, as we've just established, it isn't really known for anything, but as with most of the Central Asian stands, football is the nation's most popular sport. Popularised in the 1920s, when the first football teams began to spring up and play organised matches, Tajikistan's Football Federation was founded in 1936, followed by a nationwide league known as the Tajik League, and now the Tajik Higher League, in 1937. There would be no Tajikistan national team, because at this time, Tajikistan was part of the Soviet Union. From the first Persian Empire in more than 500 BC to the Termid dynasty in the 14th century, the region was ruled by several empires and conquered by kings and emperors, ranging from Alexander the Great to Genghis Khan. From the early 18th century, the region was ruled by the Emirati of Bukhara, an Uzbek state which controlled much of modern-day Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, as well as parts of Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, and Afghanistan. Then came the 19th century, though, and the explosion of a specific kind of imperialism in Asia. During this period, the Russian Empire and Great Britain fought for control of the regions of Central and South Asia in a confrontation known as the Great Game. Of course, what was a great game to military strategists, politicians and monarchs sat safely behind their desks or hidden away in palaces was not quite so jovial for those who lived on land that was being fought over. The Russian Empire defeated the Emirati of Bukhara in 1868, and Russia took covert control of the region. Few inhabitants sensed much initial alteration to their daily lives or notable Russian interference up until the early 1910s, when Muslim insurgents faced military put-downs, and then in 1916, when locals were conscripted by the Russian military to fight for Russia in World War I. Locals would be left in no doubt over who ruled the region once the Bolsheviks completed their takeover of the Russian Empire between 1917 and 1923, as brutal religious repression, primarily among Tajik region's dominant Muslim communities, arrived. It was in the 1920s that the modern-day borders of Tajikistan were drawn up by the Soviets, initially as a semi-autonomous republic within the Uzbek SSR, before becoming a fully-fledged Soviet republic known as the Tajik Soviet Socialist Republic, or Tajik SSR, in 1929. It was into this era of Stalinist purges, religious repression, and the implementation of collectivization that football arrived in Tajikistan, providing the same sense of joy and escapism that had already popularized the sport in some of the most troubled parts of the world. Whilst Tajikistan had its own Tajik League and Tajik Cup as part of the Soviet Union, Tajik clubs were also eligible to compete in the Soviet Top League, the Soviet First League, and the Soviet Cup. Within the Soviet football pyramid, the regional or republic's top flights were considered to be the third or fourth tiers within the larger Soviet pyramid at different times. Dynamo Stalinabad were the first champions of the Tajik League in 1937, and also the first Tajik representatives in the Soviet Cup in 1938. The only Tajik club to ever compete in the Soviet top league was CSK Pamid Dushanbe, who featured in the last three editions of the league in 1989, 1990, and 1991 prior to the collapse of the Soviet Union. CSK Pamid Dushanbe were, and still are, run by the Tajik army, who at one time had control of three teams in the Tajik league, and still run two, of whom Pamir are the largest and the only current top flight army run club. Given that the population of Tajikistan in 1937 was fewer than 1.5 million people when the Soviet Union had an overall population of 162.5 million and that it was fewer than 5.5 million people by 1991, by which stage the Soviet Union was home to almost 300 million people, the Tajik SSR was always likely to play a relatively minor role in the USSR's huge overall machine, and naturally also a relatively small role within the Soviet football scene. Whilst Tajik clubs struggled to establish much supremacy, some Tajik players did enjoy significant success. 
Defender Sergei Nikulin played almost 300 games for Spartak Moscow, where he won both the Soviet Top League and the Soviet Cup, in addition to winning three caps for the USSR and winning bronze with the Soviet Union at the Olympics, albeit at the most heavily boycotted Olympic Games of all time, which was the 1980 Summer Games in Moscow. Utility man Alexei Cherednek also won both the Soviet Top League and the Soviet Cup whilst playing for Ukrainian outfit Dnipro, as well as being capped by the USSR and becoming, as far as I'm aware, the only Tajik player to have ever played in the Premier League with Southampton in 1993. The last of the great Tajik SSR era players was Sergei Mandreko, who was capped by three different national teams, CIS, Russia and Tajikistan, and went on to play for the likes of Rapid Vienna and Hertha Berlin following the fall of the USSR. When the Soviet Union was dissolved at the start of the 1990s, everything changed, both on and off the pitch, in Tajikistan. Like most former Soviet republics, Tajikistan went down a path of independence, followed by unrest. The fall of the USSR created a power vacuum in the newly independent Asian state, and in 1991, Tajikistan had its first presidential elections. Ramon Nabiev of the Communist Party of Tajikistan was officially announced as the winner of the elections, securing over 60% of the votes, with a higher than 85% turnout, to overcome his closest competitor and Democratic Party candidate, Davlat Kudanazarov. However, opponents of the new president were not convinced by the legitimacy of the elections. Nabiev had previously served as the Tajik SSR's first secretary from 1982 to 1985 when he was ousted in a corruption scandal. He fought his way back into Tajik politics, but opponents of his and a future communist regime felt that he had stolen the elections by nefarious means. Like so many former Soviet republics, Tajikistan descended into civil war, arriving in May 1992, initially in the form of disorganized protesters clashing with supporters of the government. The unique unpopularity of Nabiev led to an unusual and highly dysfunctional coalition of Democrats, nationalists, and Islamists forming to wage an all-out civil war on the president and his regime, and they called themselves the United Tajik Opposition. So liberal Democrat reformists and moderates fascists and actual terrorists formed an alliance in opposition to Nabiev in one of the most extreme examples of the enemy of my enemy is my friend, regardless of our differences, in the history of global geopolitics. Nabiev and the government were backed primarily by the governments of Russia, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, but also by China, India and UN forces with soldiers from countries as varied as Nigeria, Denmark and Uruguay. The United Tajik opposition, meanwhile, were backed by the Islamic State of Afghanistan, the Taliban, and Al-Qaeda. Although the United Tajik opposition's leader, Syed Abdullah Nouri, was considered a moderate by the standards of his Islamist partners, advocating for a peaceful and gradual takeover of Tajikistan, declassified CIA documents, showed that he corresponded with Osama bin Laden about attacking the United States in 1996, which isn't particularly peaceful. The United Tajik opposition were successful in deposing Nabiev rather rapidly, forcing him to resign by force in September 1992, but the civil war would rumble on for another five years. Between 30 and 100,000 people died, and more than a million were displaced across the course of the Tajik civil war before the two sides signed a UN-led armistice agreement in Moscow in 1997. The Tajik opposition may have won the battle of deposing Nabiev, but they had lost the war. Former Soviet Navy officer and economics graduate Emma Marley Ramon had taken control of Tajikistan in November 1992, becoming an effective president, having been voted in by the members of the Supreme Soviet rather than the people of Tajikistan. Emma Marley went from de facto to declared president in November 1994, and in his first elections, he took 59.5% of the votes having banned his main opposition forces from forming political parties most of whom had subsequently boycotted the elections altogether. Throughout the 1990s, Emma Marley cracked down on any perceived threats, whether it be from the press, the public, or rival political parties. Dozens of journalists were either murdered or died in extremely mysterious circumstances as Emma Marley looked to solidify his position in the 1990s, kickstarting a regime that would have little time for dissident voices. Emma Marley claims Tajikistan's elections are free and fair, but the international community tends not to agree. When it comes to the most recent freedom in the world, press freedom and democracy indices, Tajikistan ranks alongside the likes of Saudi Arabia, North Korea and Iran as one of the least free, most repressed and most authoritarian regimes on earth. 
Emma Marley, has repeatedly restricted the freedoms of his political opponents, banning them from any self-promotion and imposing severe internet restrictions on any content they produce and any that is critical of him. When that doesn't do the trick, the president isn't afraid to take more drastic measures. Tajikistan's closest ally on the world stage is Russia, who provide 48% of Tajikistan's entire annual GDP in the form of remittances paid for Tajik workers to do labour in Russia. Emma Mali and Putin, as two de facto dictators who like to kill journalists and repress press freedoms whilst maintaining a farcical pretense of democracy, maintain an excellent relationship. That was emphasised in 2005 when Tajik politician Mamad Ruziyaz Kandarov was arrested in Russia and deported to Tajikistan, where he was handed a 23-year prison sentence. Is Kandarov now runs Tajikistan's Democratic Party, but it can't be easy to do so from behind bars, especially when Tajik prison inmates are among the worst treated prisoners on earth, subject to torture treatments and both physical and sexual abuse with TB and malnutrition running rampant within the Tajik prison system. Emma Marley has nine children, seven daughters and two sons, and it is through one of his sons that we return to the topic of Tajik football. Rustam Emma Marley is the president's eldest son, and he is widely considered to be the most powerful man in the country after his father, and also his most likely successor. As is so often the case with the sons of dictators, Rustam has many vocations, with a passion for collecting sports cars and playing football. Throughout his father's reign, Tajik football has largely been forgotten about and left to rot, with a lack of investment in infrastructure, coaching and player development. For many years following their independence, Tajikistan had quite literally been one of the worst national teams on earth, coming in as low as 165th in the FIFA World Rankings when there were fewer national teams than there are now, and with their domestic clubs not even participating in the AFC Champions League until 2019. Rustam liked football though, and what the Sons of Dictators won, the Sons of Dictators tend to get. In 2007, Rustam founded his own football club called Istiklal, meaning independence, which entered the Tajik First League, the nation's second division. Rustam appointed himself as captain and star centre forward, and Istiklal proceeded to win all 27 games in their debut campaign, finishing the season with a plus 147 goal difference, having averaged more than six goals a game. It was a pretty remarkable record, and some cynics, or just people who watched the team's games, suggested that they might have got one or two favourable decisions from the referees. Upsetting ruling family members in a regime that kills dissidents tends to be a risky business. Much easier to just give the president's son a penalty whenever he asks for one. The generous decisions kept on coming, in addition to the most significant investment of any team in the league. Rustam had the Pamir Stadium renovated in 2007, and then again in 2010, which is Tajikistan's largest stadium, and was first built in 1939, and it also tends to be the home of both the Tajik and Afghani national teams, with Afghanistan often unable to play games at their real home ground in Kabul due to the ongoing war in the country. Istiklal began to sign up the best players from all of the other teams in Tajikistan, in addition to importing talent from Eastern Europe and South America. The combination of the best players, the best facilities, and having all the referees in their back pocket proved to be a pretty effective one for Rustam's young club, as they became a totally dominant force within Tajik football. Between 2010 and 2020, Istiklal won nine league titles, becoming the nation's most successful club of all time over the course of just a 10-year span. In 2011, aged only 24, Rustam retired from playing football. Whilst I can't find any footage of him playing, he never played an international game for Tajikistan, and despite being the main man up front for the country's best club, he was never their top scorer, so it's probably safe to assume he wasn't all that good. In 2012, Rustam became the president of the Tajik Football Federation, and stated subsequently that he would no longer have anything to do with Istiklal in order to remain impartial. Onlookers suggest that maybe referees didn't get the memo, and 10 of the Tajikistan national team's current 23-man squad play their club football for Istiklal. Following Rustam's interest and investment, football in Tajikistan has improved, very slowly. In 2013, the national team reached an all-time high of 114th in the FIFA World Rankings, and they currently stand a half-decent chance of reaching the third round of 2022 World Cup qualifiers in Asia, although actual qualification would take a near miracle. In 2009, the Tajik Football Federation brought in US midfielder Troy Reddy, formerly of the Portland Timbers, to help oversee the development of Tajik football, whilst also spending five years playing in the Tajik Higher League himself, 
And more recently, passionate Uzbekistani head coach Usman Toshev was drafted in to take charge of the national team and drill some flair and adventurousness into the Tajik team. Rostam's focus presumably has been somewhat diverted in recent years by the myriad of other positions that he has been handed within his father's government, as chairman of the National Assembly, mayor of Dushanbe, and a major general within the Tajikistan Armed Forces, as well as being appointed as the State Agency for Financial Control and Measures Against Corruption Chief, which surely has to be some kind of joke given Tajikistan is among the most corrupt countries on earth precisely because of his father and he has only been given the job because his dad is president. The international community may broadly condemn the actions of Rustam's father and of Tajikistan, although somewhat bizarrely not the UK government, which appears to have sought closer ties with the authoritarian state since the resignation of Theresa May and the premiership of Boris Johnson in July 2019, but regardless of what most of the world thinks of Emma Mali, his method has made him an unrivaled political force within Tajik politics. What's more, whilst even the most barbaric regimes in the Middle East face some pressure to modernise and reform, Emma Mali is profoundly reluctant to give any concessions to his people. The biggest threat to his political domination was the Islamic Renaissance Party of Tajikistan, which was Tajikistan's last remaining Islamist party, but they too were banned by the president in 2015. As a result, in the 2020 phony Tajik presidential elections, which took place just last week, Emma Mali claimed over 92% of the vote. Perhaps the biggest threat to Emma Mali still comes from the Islamist factions who were never quite put down in the civil war. Terrorists have carried out acts in Tajikistan, pledging allegiance to the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and most recently ISIL over the years. Emma Mali uses this threat of terrorism as an excuse to carry out religious persecutions, despite the fact that they extend to non-Muslims. Although Tajikistan is a nation which is 98% Muslim, Emma Mali is part of a select number of world leaders to have come out in support of China and Xi Jinping's treatment of Uyghur Muslims in so-called re-education camps, which appear to function far more like concentration camps, with somewhere in the region of 1.5 million Muslims allegedly being subject to torture, killings, and forced sterilization. The region of Xinjiang, which is home to China's largest Muslim community and is where Xi Jinping's so-called re-education camps are based, is located on China's border with Tajikistan, and Emma Mali claims to support China's treatment of the Uyghurs in an effort to combat international terrorists. In truth, the greatest threat to Emma Mali is domestic terrorists, as his repressive regime creates a perfect breeding ground for people to be sucked into extremist ideologies, and its support for China's abhorrent behaviour stems solely from the fact that he cannot afford to get on the wrong side of either Putin or Xi due to their economic and strategic importance to his dictatorial regime. Oftentimes with these videos that tie in football and geopolitics, and involve some slightly heavier subject matter, I like to bow out with a positive. A small beacon of hope or optimism perhaps. But the reality when it comes to Tajikistan is that there is very little cause for optimism. Right now, Emma Mali's method of rapidly putting down any threats to his position has proved to be foolproof. No opposition has been able to gain momentum without being rapidly struck down, and the public are either too scared or successfully diverted from ever getting hold of anti-establishment material. If Emma Mali is to be deposed, it will either be because of an incredibly violent uprising, or a lack of support from China, or even more crucially, Russia. In either case, the transition of power and the end results are unlikely to be pleasant. As we have seen across much of the Middle East, even when deposing the most despotic tyrants and dictators, the alternatives often don't present real improvements, and can sometimes be even more frightening for the people who inhabit the countries in question. If Emma Mali were overthrown and Islamist extremists took control, that would hardly constitute a great success for right-minded people in Tajikistan or across the world. But a route to a peaceful, free, open and prosperous Tajikistan simply seems unfathomable right now. So that is it for today's somewhat depressing video, I suppose, that leaves one feeling rather powerless and hopeless when it comes to improving the lives of the people of Tajikistan, the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, and all of those fighting for change in that part of the world. If you've got any ideas, leave them in the comments, and perhaps we could pioneer a HITC7's inspired secular and peaceful coup against all of the world's despots. And to think, this channel just started with me making lists of seven about footballers and clubs. Thank you all for tuning in for today's video, hit the like button if you enjoyed or learnt anything new from today's documentary, make sure to subscribe if you'd like to see more from me in the future, and you can follow me on Twitter or Instagram, where the username is just at HITC7s.